Ideally, they would all be zero percent, but it's a physics oh, lab, so yeah, yeah. okay. I, I so though, suspect it's zero percent. So shouldn't our percentage be the same then, even though we pick different no. spots? Okay. I don't know. For some reason, my brain, I'm thinking that they should be the same, even though we're different, because they should be zero. No, it's it perfect. Yeah, because if they were the same, regardless of where you picked your axis of rotation, then the last question in analysis will be. Uh, not inappropriate, but useless. Yeah, that's a bonus five grade. I don't understand. All right, we are finished with chapters 8 through 10. Uh, master set is due on Thursday, as was done in the announcement. And what I forgot to do last time was actually state when we're going to do the quiz on 8 through 10. quiz will be on a week from today. So the problems from which I will choose are posted. The solutions for, the, for those problems are posted. So you should be able to at least see all of the problems from which I will choose. And come in with questions if you have them. Yes, Jason. So for test directions, just to clarify, we have to explain why the answer is correct. Uh, yes, I mean you you're trying to convince me that you understand how to do the problem, right? Okay. So in whatever form that takes. So I could theoretically just show where. Yes. Okay. Let's start talking about chapter eleven. Yeah, we have started, but you just wonder if you want to go to interrupt or not. Quick thing. Ibrahim. Let's do GS. Sorry. Ibrahim. Tell me about the atom.
neutrons, so electrons and protons. They're on the outer shell of the electron. They're empty. Uh, all of them? Kinsey? Aren't electrons, electrons protons, and neutrons? Not all of them are in the outer shell. Yeah, the protons and neutrons are in the center. Okay, got the center. And Kinsey, what's the last thing you said? Eight of them? It depends upon the atoms. Yeah. All right, so these are in the outer shells. These are in the nucleus. Uh, so let's first talk about small. Any idea what the size of an atom is? Rough ballpark. Very <laughs> Uh, it's about 10 to the negative 10 meters. And the nucleus? Smaller. Smaller. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And it's all about 10 to the negative 15 meters ish. Now, it does vary depending upon the atom. But at least it gives you some sort of ballpark. So, one 10 billionth of a meter the size of the atom. So how do we even know there's a nucleus? <laughs> Is it theoretical? No, there, well, there's pretty strong evidence for it existing. Uh, the no, but there was the belief at some point that you have this mass here with the electrons sort of populating. There was the non-nucleus model of it. Um, I guess the way the electrons, because they don't know, really know they circulate now, they just kind of, the way they are drawn to a specific I, area. I didn't think we'd get into a chicken and egg argument there. I think, yeah. <laughs> We have to have the nucleus first before we start making those predictions. Because when we actually look at an atom, if we get high power microscope and as we look and get closer and closer, what we basically see is just the a haze. This is my drawing of a haze. So we can't actually see an atom. Uh, well, since what would you define as the atom? We can't really see an electron. Uh, we just see what's known as the electron cloud. All right, suppose you were blind and you wanted, and there's nothing in this room except for people. How would you figure out, assuming that you can't touch anyone, because I'm still trying to go with the model, we can't actually touch the nucleus. How would you figure out who's here? Or what, how many, where the people are? Sound. Okay. Sound. If they're quiet? Sound. If you had a beach ball, would that help? <laughs> Was it echo? <laughs> I said echo location. Ah, okay. Uh, actually, in a sense, that does it sort of, uh, I guess, the daredevil model. You send something out and you see where it reflects. So that's so what I was thinking, picturing a beach ball. You throw the beach ball and if it hit somebody, it would bounce back towards you. Otherwise, it would go to the other side of the room. And in essence, this was the model in the late 1800s for the app. There was still even debate into the early 1900s whether atoms really existed or not, but this was the model of um, those lines. It's known as the plum pudding model. And the fact that there's this positive charge sort of in a mush uh, with the electrons dotted in it like raisins and plum pudding. Uh, I, I'm taking this from what I've read. I'm not sure if I've actually seen plum pudding before, but they were British. 
and there's no nucleus there. So if I shot something at this, if it hit an electron, that electron would go, these electrons are tiny little particles, the, the electron goes shooting off and whatever I shot at it, if it was enough, it would just keep going through. You know, picture of Mack truck, Nat. If it hits the Nat, the truck's just gonna keep plowing forward. So Rutherford comes along and he has an experiment. Suppose we take foil, gold foil, uh, like aluminum foil, but gold. And he's gonna shoot alpha particles at it. Now, an alpha particle, we now know, is just the helium nucleus. But it's a product of radiation. There's a couple different types of radiation, one of which is alpha radiation, which we get these nuclei, what we now know are nuclei, uh, shooting out, and they're much more massive than the electron. And you shoot it at the foil. Now, most of the most of these alpha particles will go through. And so if you had a detector here, you'd shoot the particle through, and then it would hit some sort of scintillating plate, and you would look and count, oh, there's one dot, there's another dot, there's another dot. And you would just count out the number of dots, and then you move this around, counting out the number of times the, this alpha particle hit this. Now, one of the guys who was doing this, who was actually in the lab counting this stuff, you know his name probably, Geiger. Uh, the guy who invented the Geiger camera. And you can imagine that if you're in a lab constantly counting little, flat, tiny little flashes of light, you would try to think of some better way of actually detecting that stuff. <clears throat> and although he's one of the more famous uh, students of, of Rutherford, he was not one of the eight grad students that Rutherford had who ended up winning Nobel Prizes. So you go around and you eventually start looking over here. Now it seems ridiculous. If this model is true, there's no way that any of these alpha particles would bounce backwards. But you continue looking around and you do occasionally see alpha particles go shooting backwards. You do some math and you start to figure out the size of a nucleus. If I'm shooting an alpha particle at this target, how big does the nucleus need to be in order for whatever percentage to bounce back into that direct, at that angle? So this was the famous gold foil experiment which told us that there is a nucleus. Now, the two particles in the nucleus, at that point they figured protons were in the nucleus, they knew it was positively charged. Neutrons would not be figured out for another 30 years. Eventually they figured out there are neutrons there. But it makes sense that they're neutrons because what do you know about charges? They can cancel each other out. Uh, they can. They're beta electrons. Say it again. Beta electrons. So people who've had some chemistry in here. Uh, there are valence electrons, but what can you tell me about how about spike charges? If I had two positives here, what would they do? Be. Your hand gesture is correct. Yeah. Repel. Repel. Like repels, opposites. Attract. Yeah. So if I've got a proton here and another proton here trapped in this, in a small space here, it seems logical that they want to get away from each other. That proton wants to go this way, that proton wants to go that way. Why on earth do the does the nucleus even stay together? <clears throat> so there's got to be something else that is keeping them together. And so they eventually figure out that there are these neutral particles there, which help bind them together. The ones that keeps them separated. You know, like the protons want to get into a fight, neutron steps in there and says, wait, hold on. But it doesn't push them too far because there is another force that's actually attracting here. And here's, gets into the really clever naming convention they came up with. 
there's a force that's holding these protons who want to get away from each other, but it's holding them together. It, it must be some strong force, and so they called it the strong force. Now, sometimes nuclei will break up. That's obviously not keeping them together. It doesn't happen that often, but so it's not a, it's not a strong force. And they came up with a clever name of yes, the weak force. All right, so we have these nuclei. Now, with the protons and neutrons, they actually have a classification, they have a separate name called nucleons. So, if you hear me make a reference to a nucleon, I'm talking either proton or neutron. Because in essence, that's where most of the mass comes from. In an atom, because electrons, again, much lighter, uh, much less massive, proportionally, my mass is closer to an elephant's mass than an electron is to a proton or neutron. <coughs> what is the charge of a neutron? So, okay. So, charge is zero. What about an electron? Negative. And a proton? Positive. <clears throat> what is the charge of an electron? You've obviously had some chemistry. What is a negative one? Okay, did you get farther than that? It's negative one charge, whatever that charge is. Now, the symbol for charge, as you would expect, is a cube. Uh, I suspect it comes from quantity. So the charge of an electron, so the symbol for an electron, it is negatively charged, and so that is the symbol of an electron. A proton is a P with a plus sign, and a neutron is a lowercase n with a zero there. And so the charge of an electron, just shorthand notation because of course, I was about writing the whole thing out. Negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Coulomb is just the unit of charge. The charge of a proton positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. They are not vectors, they're scalars. And we'll get into more math with those numbers later on. So if I have equal number of protons and neutrons, Sorry, equal number of protons and electrons, the total charge of the atom would be? Yeah. Yes. So, what determines what the atom is? Nope. How's an oxygen atom different from a carbon atom? What determines the atomic number? Proton and neutron. Say? Proton and neutron. That would be closer to atomic mass. Atomic number? Proton. Yep. The number of protons is what determines. So if you hear about the atomic number, that is the number of protons. The atomic mass is roughly equal to number of protons and neutrons. So let's bring out our handy dandy periodic table.
hopefully you can see well enough. I'll try to point to up different sides here. All right, so as we're looking at the, at, these are all the elements, well, at least as of time of manufacturing. The ones that are clear down there, so basically after uranium and then these up here, those are man-made. We can make atoms. Of course, one question might be, why on earth would you need to? Partly testing models. That's probably the main thing, and then bragging rights. And there are certain rules about naming them. There's also some naming rights involved also. So as we look at this, the atomic number is this number right here. So this is the number of protons in the nucleus. So we got hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, uh, titanium has 22, oxygen over there has eight, carbon has six. This number underneath is the atomic mass. Officially, It is the mass, so the atomic mass, is the mass in grams of a mole of that element. So, for example, sodium, if I took a mole, which is just a number, if I took a mole of sodium, I would have 22.989707 grams. So why a mole? What is a mole? 